I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Kevin Mitchell. He is a professor of genetics and neuroscience at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and he is the author of the book Innate, How the Wiring of Our Brains Shapes Who We Are. Kevin, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks very much, Adam. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to have you here. So Kevin, could you please uh, briefly summarize the main idea of your book and what we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Yeah. Well, as the as the subtitle um, says, it's how the wiring of our brains shapes who we are. Really, um, it's a kind of, I hope, a, a fresh take on the nature nurture question of what makes us all the way that we are, uh, the way that we behave, what defines our our psychology and how does it get that way. And um, as the title suggests, the word innate, um, I you know try to put forward the evidence that we do have innate psychological predispositions in large part based on um, genetic variations that we all carry. But one of the main themes, I guess, is that um, that also the processes of brain development themselves add a lot of variation. There's just some stochastic random events there that mean that uh, you know the wiring of our brains is really unique. Um, and also, I suppose the, the goal is in a way in, in exploring that relationship between our our genes and our traits to um, try and get away from a static deterministic sort of viewpoint and, and come up with a, or land on a much more dynamic interactionist view that involves this sort of ongoing interplay with the environment and, and very much a, uh, the, using the lens of development to understand that relationship because that's how, that's how it's expressed. You know, that's how that relationship is realized. Um, and I think that really was part of the motivation there um, to give that developmental perspective. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm really excited to talk about all of this. Great. So I, I've learned through talking with, with many neuroscientists that it seems like there's two main camps. There's the people who do neuroimaging work, and that seems to be almost uh, more akin to psychology or data science when you're conducting these experiments and looking at human brains. And then there's like neurobiology and genetics, which seems to be your background. So how did that give you a different perspective on this problem? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, coming, so my background was in uh, genetics in, in mm -hmm. the first instance, and I became interested in the problem of, of development generally. And we had a, when I was an undergrad, a great course on developmental biology in Drosophila, which got me really um, enthused about using, you know, the fly as a model organism. Um, and then I went to do my PhD in a lab that was doing development uh, in Drosophila, but development of the nervous system. And that was uh, Corey Goodman's lab at Berkeley. And um, the goal there was to use the fly as an organism to understand uh, and illustrate really the basic principles of how the nervous system gets put together. Um, and with, with the basic premise that, that the, the mechanisms and principles and even many of the molecules, as it turns out, will be conserved evolutionarily. And so the you know, in answer to your question, coming from a basic neurobiology point of view, really, I think, cements the evolutionary um, way of thinking about biological questions. Uh, and I think, you know, by contrast, maybe many of the people who come into neuroscience through the human side, clinical side, or, or you know, fMRI and psychology can have a very human-focused view of things. Um, which is great in, in one way, obviously humans are really interesting, uh, but in another way, I, I think can be a bit blinkered maybe. I mean, I'm probably going to get hammered for saying it that way, but, um, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't spring fully formed as a species from the head of Zeus, right? You know, we evolved, we're evolved mammals, we're evolved yeah. animals. Um, and the, um, the way that our brains work reflects that evolution. And I guess that that feeling probably comes through uh, in the way that the book is is written. And it's, uh, you know, I should own it probably as a bias uh, mm -hmm. or a, a prior uh, position that um, that many of the things that, that we know about how animals' brains work will apply to humans as well. And maybe, you know, an example would be about sex differences, say. Uh -huh. um, and there's, there's an argument that, that goes on there um, that I find a bit, bemusing uh, at one level and people say there's no evidence for you know sex differences in in humans and it, it sort of just ignores this huge literature of uh, what we know about sex differences in other animals mm -hmm. um that that just 
it, it seems, like I said, a little bit of a blinkered view, whereas uh, I suppose my, my own background in, in much broader biology and other organisms uh, gives me quite the opposite view. And like sure. I said, some people may see that as a bias, um, and that's, that, that's probably fair. It, it is my bias. Uh -huh. So in your research, did you ever make the transition to humans or have you had all this on the back burner and it eventually turned into innate? Yeah, no, I did. And I've had a great opportunity. Um, so I went from working on flies to working on mice for my postdoc, which I did with um, Mark Tessier-Levine, which was looking at how, you know, nerves are guided to different parts of the brain. Um, and once there in mice started thinking about not just how did the nervous system get put together based on the instructions in the genome, but what are the consequences of that? Because really, you know, you have to think of a, of a loop that goes from the genome to the, the encoding the developmental program for the organism, which includes the wiring of the brain, but that is to do things, right, for the organism to, so that it can carry out some behavioral functions, cognitive functions and perceptual and so on. And then to close the loop, natural selection has a look at that and says, well, how is this working? Uh, and then it, it basically has a, a commentary back on uh, onto the genome. And, um, and in effect, the only thing that natural selection can work on is that developmental program. It doesn't really, it's not a behavioral program. It's a program of development that makes a brain that carries out some, some behaviors. So we started, I started to get interested with people in my group um, in thinking about, well, you know, not, we, we would use mutations in animals to try and figure out what are the instructions for building the brain? But in the process, you can also ask, well, what happens to the animals when their brains are miswired like this? Do they develop any interesting you know, behaviors? Uh, maybe they could be models for neurodevelopmental disorders, for example. And we have a few different lines of mice that have you know, um, uh, seizures or um, psychosis-like behavior or um, attention deficit hyperactivity like behavior. And I'm being, you know, caveating those, those terms there. There's, a, there's some reasons why we can say that. Um, but then I also was really fortunate uh, to st strike up some collaborations with people doing human genetics, people doing psychiatry in, in Trinity College, and also people doing psychology. And one of the most interesting ones was about synesthesia, where um, it, a condition where um, you know, it's described as a mixing of the senses where people, for example, colors or something yeah, they like might, that. they might see, they might see colors when they hear sounds, for example. So, mm -hmm. um, for me, that was really interesting because one of the basic developmental things we were interested in was how do different parts of the cortex that maybe ordinarily mediate vision or hearing or, um, or even, uh, more specifically color processing or sound or speech or um, language and so on. How do they get specified developmentally? What's the genetic program? We still don't really know much about that. Um, but a, a window into that in humans might be this condition synesthesia where it seems like the normal segregation of cortical systems, subsystems, is, is in some way broken down. There's some cross connections there that aren't normal. Um, and it's a genetic uh, condition. So we became really interested in that. That gave me a window into doing some human experiments with colleagues, including you know, fMRI and EEG and, uh, and so on, which was a great um, learning experience for me, not just about synesthesia, but about the, those fields and the way they work and the way, um, the way people in those fields think. How did it compare uh, working with flies and mice to mice and humans, because most people probably bunch the smaller animals together, but I have a hunch that with both of us being mammals, us and, and mice, there might be more similarities there than between mice and flies. Yeah, I mean, there's similarities at different levels. So when we were going from flies to mice or humans, what we were interested in was using flies to get at the molecules that control where nerves grow. Um, going from mice to humans, there's another level of similarity in terms of cognitive operations, the way the brain is organized, um, which is much, much closer than for flies. I mean, there's people who would argue you can, you can do a kind of a cognitive science in flies. And I think actually there's really good evidence for that. There, there's much more sophisticated stuff going on that's very relevant um, to what we do in terms of you know, action selection and valuation of outcomes and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, from, from mice to humans, um, 
it's much closer. And obviously that's why mice are used as, you know, preclinical models for things like psychiatric disorders, where even though you, you can't say a mouse is schizophrenic, you, you may be able to define a state both behaviorally and neurally that you can be reasonably confident is relevant to something like psychosis. Mm -hmm. So the drugs kind of affect them this, in the same way as just at much lower doses. Yeah, well, I mean, you could take the pharmacology as a kind of um, a, a piece of evidence that what you're looking at is relevant. If, for example, there's a behavior that's caused by drugs that in humans cause psychosis, then you could say, well, you're investigating some kind of a neural state that's potentially relevant. And especially if it's treated by antipsychotics, um, you know, then you have uh, some good evidence there as well. And that's why I was saying earlier when we had some mutations that cause those behaviors, you know, they're made worse by drugs that cause psychosis and they're made better by drugs that treat it. So there's a level at which you can uh, investigate those things in mice that, you know, would be a stretch to do in flies. So you started working with humans and you had this background in, in animal work and, and genetics, and it was sort of guided by these more evolutionary lines of thinking. Um, at what point did you seriously decide to put all this into a book? Yeah, I mean, it probably came, I guess, from, um, from interactions with my, with my colleagues, uh, you know, in psychology and, and psychiatry, but also very much from a course that I teach in behavioral genetics. So I became very interested in um, behavioral genetics just as a field and, and um, you know, teaching it as, a, as an undergrad course. It's obviously really, really interesting. And one of the things that became clear over time was that my other interest of developmental genetics uh, just merged, you know, with behavioral genetics. It turns out that behavioral genetics is the genetics of brain development. Those two things are in fact the same thing, but it wasn't, um, it, it, it wasn't necessarily obvious. I think it wasn't seen that way. And so what I wanted to do in, in, in writing the book was to give that developmental perspective on behavioral genetics. And, and really the point being, as I said earlier, that the way in which genotypes are realized, you know, there's a potential in a genotype, uh, in a fertilized egg, there's a potential to make a human being, right? And that and a potential to, um, to contribute to some variation in the traits of that human being. The way that that is realized is through the processes of development. And it turns out that when you look at, um, you know, the genes that have been found that where variation and then contributes to variation in things like personality traits or intelligence or risk of psychiatric disorders, the one class of genes that consistently enriched in those, um, among those genes are genes involved in neural development and the processes involved in neural development. So, um, you know, one of the, the things I really wanted to get across and that motivated me to write the book was to pull away from the idea that there are specific sets of genes for genes for autism or genes for intelligence or genes for extroversion like that's the function of the gene and 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 it suggests that there's some very direct molecular underpinning of those cognitive or psychological functions and really i think the research shows that there are genes for building a brain and it takes the whole genome probably really you know variation in lots of genes can affect how the brain develops and then indirectly manifest in different aspects of our psychology, but there's, there's no direct relationship for the most part between the molecular functions of the genes and the psychological functions or cognitive functions that we're looking at. It's just too, uh, too, too wide a, um, a range to span. And so there's, there's mm -hmm. very indir indirect emergent relationship between our genotypes and our psychology and I think that that feel, felt to me like a kind of a necessary corrective, maybe um, to get away from really deterministic, linear, the direct sort of um, way of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. So then the behavioral part of behavioral genetics, as we traditionally hear about it, what are people doing exactly when they try and relate specific genes to specific behaviors? Well, uh, it depends. So broadly speaking, the field has moved. Uh, I mean, there's been tremendous, tremendous progress in the field lately, um, I guess, on two fronts. One is um, finding, you know, rare mutations that have big effects on our psychology. And, you know, there's nothing new. There's there's tons of such mutations. And, um, 
many of them frankly result in uh, a, a disorder of some kind, right? So all the things that cause intellectual disability or um, conditions like autism or schizophrenia are affecting our behavior. Um, but, uh, you know, also then, you know, what people would think, okay, well, that, that, that's just sort of pathological clinical genetics. It's not really behavioral genetics across what you would call the statistically normal range of, of behavior. And I use that advisedly. It's not a judgmental term. It's just the statistical term. Um, and so there's been an idea that maybe, you know, more since these are continuous traits and they're complex traits, genetically speaking, that they would be underpinned by variation that's more common in the genome. There wouldn't just be, you know, it's not like eye color. There's a few different uh, mutations that we that we can carry that, you know, convey it. It would be much more complicated, more like height, where there's lots and lots of variation um, that's quite common in the genome, but each little one that you could find would only be having a tiny effect by itself. And so the, the new technology that arose, which is not that new now, 15 years ago, maybe, um, these genome-wide association studies could look at that common variation, could find in, in, it has to be in massive, massive samples of people to find these tiny, tiny effects. But the upshot was that um, many of these traits are highly polygenic. That means they, they involve in every individual, lots of genetic variations um, and across the population, lots and lots of genetic variation. And um, so when people are trying to then find the specific genes involved, what they'll what they might do is, you know, a GWAS for intelligence or something like that. These days, you know, it turns up hundreds of different genes. And then what you have to ask yourself is, okay, well, what does that tell us about the biology underneath that? And it might have been the case that the biology would, you know, maybe it would have all pointed towards the glutamate pathway or the GABA pathway or serotonin or something like that, you know, that would uh, potentially underpin differences in intelligence. Maybe it would have been, you know, metabolic rate or how fast your neurons work or something like that. Um, and it, it turns out it, it didn't, right? You know, it was, this was a discovery science and, and what it discovered was actually it points towards development, as I was saying earlier, which in, on, you know, on the one hand is a really interesting discovery, and on the other hand, is super, super non-specific and irritating, <laughs> because it just doesn't it it just doesn't give a handle on um, very direct molecular pathways underpinning different mental cognitive operations. In fact, what it says is there aren't molecular pathways underpinning uh, you know different molecular operations in a very in any specific kind of way. Of course, a lot of the brain function has molecular underpinnings you know that's how it's a it's an electrochemical machine with the chemical element there being crucial to how the electrical elements work um it's just not there just aren't very specific linkages from particular genes and pathways to particular mental functions right so when we're talking about individual differences in the genome whether that's through like mutations or natural selection or something those might manifest over evolutionary spans of time but then in terms of Things we can actually observe it seems like what these developmental effects have to do with gene environment interactions right well the way i would put it is this so we we mm -hmm. you know people talk about the human genome and there's no such uh -huh. thing no no person right. <laughs> on the planet has the human genome we all have a human genome which is a variant mm -hmm. of of the whole thing so if you think about human nature at a species level being encoded in our dna in the same way that dog nature is encoded in dog DNA and crocodile nature is encoded in crocodile DNA, then, um, uh, then you also have to think, okay, this, this canonical human genome is the, is the recipe or the program to make a canonical human brain that, that mediates canonical human psychology, but no individual has any of those, you know, that canonical version. We all have variations on that theme in the same way that we have, you know, variations of facial morphology and, uh, every, you know, physical structure, everything else um, that's encoded in, in the human genome. So really it's inevitable that there would be genetic influences on those traits. So they still apply and they have a big effect on our psychology. It's just that those effects are indirect and non-specific, right? It's a big gamish 
of genetic effects all, all sort of mixed up and it's hard to go in there and and say well this genetic effect maps to that psychological trait and this one maps to that psychological trait that's just not the way it has turned out to be and we didn't know that mm -hmm. before all this work was done but now we do know that i think mm -hmm. um which which does mean that you know once you've done that work and those those genome-wide association studies and so on trying to press into that and dig into those data in the hopes of finding those specific relationships to me is a kind of at this stage a bit of a lost cause mm -hmm. frankly um, i've heard various stats of like we share 90 percent of our dna with mice and 99 percent with chimps and 99.99 percent or maybe more with with other humans so is that overlap is that part fixed well, um, so that's interesting. So if we say, uh, take the comparison with chimps, I think it's something like 98.4% identical mm -hmm. with chimps, right? Um, so which means that the 1.6% that's different is responsible for the differences between chimps and humans, including the differences in the way our brains are wired um, and our psychological natures, our cognitive capacities, our behavioral tendencies, and, and everything else, right? So... Well, not everything else, because of course, one of the outcomes of our behavioral capacities and cognitive capacities in humans is that we develop language and then cultural evolution on top of that, you know, took us, uh, you know, off to the races, basically. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to be too biologically deterministic about it, but even, you know, if you raise a chimp in human society, it still won't develop those capacities. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to think of that difference between chimps and humans um, as leading to the differences between human nature and chimp nature. And then it's just an extrapolation of that idea. We're all 99.9% .9 similar to each other, uh, but that 0.1% obviously has some impact um, on mm -hmm. our individual natures as, like I said, variations on that theme of, of broad human nature. It's inevitable. There's no, there's no way that couldn't be the case. There's no way psychological traits could not have some genetic variation to them mm -hmm. um, if they have any genetic basis to them at all. Uh -huh. Then there, there must be variation in them. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talk about twin studies where even, even people that have like identical genomes still turn out differently over, over like the course of development. Could we, could we talk about that? Yeah, well, so that's the flip side of what I just said, right? So what uh -huh. I just said makes it sound like I might be a genetic determinist, which I'm not at all. So the, right. the, genome, the genome does not specify the outcome. It doesn't specify a particular outcome. What it specifies is the rules, the biochemical rules and cellular developmental rules by which a, a growing embryo becomes patterned, cells become differentiated, they migrate to the right areas, and, and in the brain, they, they connect up with each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, but all of those processes are really noisy in, in engineering terms. So all the, the genome can do is encode, I should, I'm this kind of a cell, uh, I'm going to interpret these signals, I'm going to turn these genes on or off and make this much protein. And then what the proteins do is no longer under the control of the genome. And, you know, proteins jitter about, they get degraded, they more get made, they bind to each other, they release. Um, you know, all of that, all of that is subject to molecular jitter um, and all kinds of, of randomness and stochastic elements. Um, now, ordinarily, you know, in, in any given cell, those, you just have fluctuations that are, that are happening and the cell uh, effectively buffers its physiology to accommodate that noise. But during development, because development is inherently nonlinear, where each step in development re re relies on the previous one having happened properly, um, there are, sometimes the, the noise can be amplified. And so you can get quite different outcomes from the same starting genome. And so, you know, when we see um, identical twins, we look at their physical structure, faces and so on, we can see, well, first thing that strikes us is, wow, they're really similar. Uh, but then when you look in more detail, you can say, well, okay, but there's some differences between them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at twins' brains, then you can see, yeah, the brains of identical twins are super, super similar to each other. Uh, as adults, they're super similar to each other as children, but they're not identical to each other. There's quite variation in the, the kinds of parameters that, that you can measure 
with neuroimaging, which is pretty crude, but you can see, you know, measure the thickness of different parts of the brain or the size given over to, um, you know, the visual parts or the auditory parts or language parts or whatever. So, um, like I said, it's a, it's a sort of a perspective shift, right? You know, mm -hmm. the first the first point, they're so similar to each other, really shows how much genetics controls the patterning of our brains and not just mm -hmm. the patterning you you can look at all kinds of functional parameters of how the brain works and functional connectivity um and and so on but then the flip side is to say okay but there's a limit there's a limit yeah. to the genetic determinism um and in fact there's a lot of room for just this developmental variation to be at play and then of course there's room for experience to be at play um you know after birth as we start to um explore the environment and i think there's a um there's been a tendency to think of nature versus nurture as mapping onto genes versus environment, you know, putting these two mm -hmm. things at, at, at odds with each other as if they're an alternative choice that we have right. for what explains, um, or, or either that they're independent factors that both influence um, our, our psychology. Mm -hmm. And I, they're, they're not independent at all. And I think there's a really interesting relationship between those where our genetic, um, our genetic makeup affects and the way our brains develop affect our psychological predispositions. Um, so we do start out different from each other. And then those predispositions themselves influence the way that we experience the world, the things that we find rewarding, um, the way that we respond to those experiences in then over time, crafting our own environment and choosing to do the things that we like and not choosing to do the things we don't like. Um, and then I think that can amplify initial differences so that we, the, the environment and, and genetics, there's a, there's a constant sort of feedback loop between our, our, our underpinning psychology and the way our habits emerge over time, our actual behavior. Um, so our genes don't control our, our, our behavior on a moment to moment basis. They do set up a baseline of a psychological predispositions and so on. Uh, we, which then influence our behavior, but through this interactive loop kind of way um, over the trajectory of our lives. Mm -hmm. So now we get into this more philosophical question of, you know, even if our behavior isn't completely deterministic, is that because we just can't predict it? Or is the, the, is the noise, does it actually introduce real freedom, like freedom that's meaningful to us? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question, and it's one that I'm really um, totally obsessed with now. So I'm uh -huh. working on a, a a new a new book at the moment about really about free will, but ultimately ground it, trying to ground that in a more basic question about biological agency. So the question comes up uh, kind of in response to what I've just been saying that you know if we're wired a certain way, um, then then at any given moment you might say, well, I'm making choices based on what I want to do, okay? And that's fine. But, you know, many philosophers would have argued, well, the, that's not sufficient to say that we really have free will if you're not choosing the way that you're wired, right? If you're wired a certain way and you say, someone invites you to a party and you say, no, I don't want to go because I don't feel like it. Well, fine, you're expressing your, your you know, your, that's yourself making a choice, uh, but even if you allow that that's true, you didn't make the choice to not feel like it. Right. And, and so you're into this sort of, you're into this loop there. If I didn't choose the way that I am, uh, then am I really free? And some people, you know, have argued that you're not, and that in fact, we have no capacity to introspect on our motives or to, in any sense, transcend those, uh, those motives that, that actually they're just, our, our desires are just given to us uh, on a momentary basis, and, and we ourselves have no uh, play in that. Uh, we, we play no part in that process, which, um, which I think is not correct. Actually, we, <laughs> introspection is what we spend huge amounts of time doing, and I think we're wired, we're wired in a way where we have enough levels of our neural hierarchy where you know, the, you can think about some of the lower levels are representing like objects in the world, representing, um, you know, goals and in an implicit way, in the same way that a, a, a fly might do, right? Um, where, and, and it, so in any given situation, 
your, you, your brain has a representation. What's out in the world? What are my current goals? How do I want to achieve that? And even, uh, you know, what did I do the last time I was in this situation? And is my, you know, has my evaluation system, my reward system told me that was a good thing to do or not? So the learning that you've gone through previously uh, has led to your current state. But, but in humans, we have more levels to that. Our cognition involves metacognition where the objects that are being processed or represented at the really high levels are not just what's out in the world, what's my internal state, what, what should my goal be, but they're things like, what are my beliefs? What are my desires? Uh, why do I have those desires? And, um, and, and, and it's a sort of a, a theory of mind that we all have about ourselves. And we have it about other people as well. And, um, you know, some people like to point to areas where examples where people are doing things for no good reason or they don't or their reasons are opaque to them they don't actually know what their reasons are and they make up these stories afterwards and a lot of times it's it's neurological patients who have some impairment that reveals this um and you know they like to make a big deal out of this like the implication is that we never know what we're doing why we're doing it um and i don't think that extrapolation is warranted at all i think we do know right. so you know, in, in, ter in those terms, I think um, the human brain is wired in such a way that we do have some access to the inner workings of our own cognition. And we can, doesn't mean we do all the time or even frequently, but we can inspect um, our own goals and inspect our own desires and beliefs and in the mm -hmm. process uh, potentially change them. So yeah. I, I do think we have um, that, kind of, that kind of free will. So the next level up in this problem is is sort of once you grant this conscious experience and decision making ability, whether consciousness precludes decision making or whether it's epiphenomenal, like whether the, all these automatic processes are sort of happening in the brain and we make our decisions and then conscious awareness of that is like a byproduct of those decisions. Yeah. So I don't think so. Um, I mean, I would, I, I think that um, consciousness is part of that, that model, model of the self, the model of, it's the mind modeling its own operations in a sense, um, in the way that the mind models the external world and, and makes it available for cognition. I think my view, and this is, you know, it's speculative, like most things about consciousness, is that it's the mind making its own operations uh accessible to another part of the mind or another part of the brain basically um so so my view is that consciousness and and metacognition and that kind of introspection are all sort of bound up together um of course many many of the things that we do are not we're not consciously deciding to do them which is and that's good you know some people would say again they'd point to that and say look you're not really freely choos choosing to do that that's just habitual behavior good I want it to be habitual behavior. If I spent, if I had to think, you know, from first principles about every decision I'd making, well, I'll have, I'd have been dead long ago uh, yeah. because I'd be, <laughs> I couldn't decide what to do. But I, but it just takes too long, right? You know, so, um, so the idea that we offload a lot of our um, behavioral choices to our our, our non-conscious habitual systems is a good thing. That's your. That's a really a major part of what makes you yourself. The development of those habits, and you know, many of those are conscious policies that we decided on long ago, um, that we're now sort of executing. Where we don't go back and question the policy anymore, right? But, it, but we do things that are in accord with that. So you know, many of your listeners may, for example, have long ago decided to go to college and to study neuroscience, and then listening to a podcast like this might be one of the things to do that's consistent with that previous policy that they no longer wake up in the morning and go, should I really do this neuroscience degree? Um, so yeah, you know, a, a lot of our behavior is, is offloaded. Um, we make conscious deliberative decisions when we need to. Um, and again, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a very efficient way to guide behavior. And, and, and in fact, again, the evolutionary point of view, I think is really crucial here because you, I mean, the, the, the arc, I guess, of the book that I'm writing at the moment is to try and frame the, the problem of free will in humans, but then very much make the argument that 
<laughs> that humans are the last place we should start to try and understand this problem uh, because it's maybe the most complicated instantiation of it that we know. So let's start with really simple systems and ask, well, how does any system, how does any organism do something? If it's just a bag of molecules, how can it, how can it have causal power? How can a bacterium be a locus of causal power or agency in the universe when, you know, prior to the evolution of life, nothing did anything in the universe. Things just happened, right? You know, rocks and stars and planets and so on. Things happened, chemistry happened, physics happened, but nothing did anything uh, because there was nothing that could choose to do one thing or another. But at some point that evolved. Um, and so trying to understand how that happened in the first place and then how did the systems build up that granted some behavioral sophistication that was beneficial from the point of view of natural selection, uh -huh. um, that allowed things to persist more, that did those behaviors, that had those capacities. Um, and then you get a kind of a natural buildup where it's perfectly reasonable that a lot of our, sub, um, a lot of our behavioral processing is subconscious. It's subconscious mm -hmm. in a bacterium as well. Um, it's yeah. subconscious in a, you know, at a sea urchin or a, um, a hydra or something like that. Uh, but, but at some point, humans developed these extra levels, which allowed us to kind of look back down and see some of that processing happening. Uh -huh. So what do you think of the idea of momentum? Like when we're talking about habits and free will, it seems like the, the, the more deeply a certain habit is ingrained, the harder it is to break. But we do have the free will to break it but at the same time it's like it, it requires more energy it seems the longer it's been going on yeah i think that's absolutely right we um yes things get ingrained um you know if and 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 unfortunately things habits can get ingrained even if they turn out to be maladaptive or or not a good idea right and right. you know in some cases that's because the system has been hijacked by you know like drugs for example so drug addiction mm -hmm. basically just hijacks your your reward system and your reward system is used to build habits by saying mm -hmm. by telling you this was a good thing to do so so in the in a, any given situation you sh should seek to do that again right mm -hmm. um so yeah the more we do things it, they become ingrained in multiple ways first of all they become um almost opaque or not even apparent that we're that we're doing it. We, we cease to question even the idea that we should do it. It's just so implicit that we, we don't even recognize there's a choice, uh, there's a choice space that we're operating in at that stage. The choice is so narrowed that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so sort of intuitive that we don't stop to question, why am I even doing this in the first place? Uh -huh. You know, I could really be, do you kind of have to have to back out of, uh, you know, the tunnel that you've gone down to even see the landscape of choice that might be no longer, um, uh, your brain is no longer really aware of. So mm -hmm. yeah, break, breaking cool habits, take. breaking habits is very effortful, but it is possible. Um, but it requires some, sometimes some insight and, um, you know, that's where, uh, therapy and, 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 um, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, meditation and things like that can be really useful because they can allow us to get some insight onto, um, things, like I said, that we just stopped questioning long ago as our basic operating procedure. Um, you know, you, you tend to question the very, the, the, the behaviors that you're doing right now, the endpoints mm -hmm. of this without backing off and saying, well, hang on a sec, how did I get here? You know, why am I in this is situation? What are my motivations for this? And that kind of thing can can allow, with difficulty, people to um, to change their habits, to change their um, the way that they've adapted to the world. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this idea of of like borderline cases of free will. So imagine um, you you want to go to the gym and work out, but you're feeling too tired and lazy, and you wouldn't do it, and then suddenly your friend calls you and says, I'm outside, I'm picking you up to go to the gym right now. And you think, okay, fine, he's there. I'll just get out and go. But let's say that never happened and you wouldn't have gone alone. So then it's like, in, in either case, you feel like you're using your free will to go or not to go, but you're influenced by this outside factor that ends up being the deciding factor. Yeah. 
Well, sure. I mean, you know, our behaviors are, are context dependent and they're situation dependent and they're responsive to um, to other people. But I think that's a that's an illustration of a a situation where you're making a choice. You know, it's not it's not a hugely um, consequential choice in the moment, right? Whether you go today or not. Uh, you know, it's not the biggest uh, life decision that you're ever going to make, right? So uh, what that may mean is that you're, um, you're open to being swayed by some outside factor. And, and and that's fine. You know, again, people might point to that and say, oh, you're not really free. Look, you just did it because your friend came by. <laughs> yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. It's not a big deal. Uh, some decisions are like that. You're, you could go one way or the other. You don't have a huge, um, you're, you're, you're either indifferent to the outcome or there's pros and cons on both on both sides, and so they're sort mm -hmm. of weighted. They're weighted equally, and then it makes sense uh, actually to be for, for something to tip the tip the balance like that. So there's lots of things like that, and I, I guess the what I argue we should resist is the tendency to make big sweeping extrapolations from cases like that, where yeah, a lot of times we're not making decisions deliberately. That doesn't mean we never make decisions deliberative, deliberatively or don't have that don't have that faculty. Yeah, I have this this theory relating to free will that I want to run by you and, and see what you think of it. So the idea is that when you're talking about a problem like this, you're you're it requires sort of identity of the agent you're talking about. So uh, so so for example, if we're talking about whether you have free will or not, we're also talking about whether you exist or not like as this as this constrained agent uh so have you heard of the the ship of theseus problem mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's where if imagine you have a ship and you take one plank off and you replace it with another and you keep doing that over and over again until none of the original material remains and the question is is it the same ship and my answer to that would be that what you're doing each time you replace a plank is you're basically saying this is the ship and then you're re-updating your definition of the ship but in reality maybe the ship doesn't exist outside of your mind so how that i would connect that to this free will issue is if you imagine the universe as a deterministic system we are little pieces of that system and when we look at just us it seems like we're free when ignoring the rest of it but then the more you include it seems like the less free will we have so the more you zoom out so for example, in this, in this going to the gym example, when you're just looking at you inside your room, you have much more freedom than when you zoom out and consider outside factors that have influenced it. And especially if you, if you zoom out temporally and start thinking of developmental factors that biased you in one direction or the other. Yeah. Well, um, that, I mean, I think you've hit, you've hit on the problem in, in a very similar way to the way I'd like to explore it myself. So mm -hmm. in the question, you know, do you have free will? an awful lot of ink has been spilled about what free means and what will means. And mm -hmm. I think the crucial word in that sentence is you. What yeah. does you mean? <laughs> what, does it, what does it mean to be you? And for example, um, you know, some people like Sam Harris, uh, for example, have uh, argued that if there's any antecedent cause whatsoever that affects your decision in some way, that constrains your decision in some way when you're making it, including the way you are right now, that that means you're not free. And so he defines a kind of an absolute freedom, which is not just freedom from external coercion, or, or but it's freedom from your own past self, in a sense. And for me, that that is kind of um, almost uh, nonsensical in the sense that yourself is defined by that continuity over time. There is no other sense in which you are a self. There's no such thing as an instantaneous <laughs> self. Selfhood right. is a temporal process of continuity, mm -hmm. right? And so the, I want to be constrained by my past experiences and my prior actions because that's me. If you mm -hmm. removed all those constraints, I would not exist anymore. Uh, there would just be decision-making by wh whimsy and, and caprice on any moment, mm -hmm. which again, you'd be dead pretty soon uh, because <laughs> it's not a good idea to do things whimsically. But, but also... Yeah, yourself yourself evaporates in that kind of thought experiment where you're completely, completely free. That's not, you know, it's almost a dualistic framing of what free will could be. 
So I think the, um, the concept of the self is really key. And again, you can build, you, you can naturalize that concept or operationalize it scientifically uh, by taking this evolutionary approach. So a bacterium has a kind of selfhood in, in a, even in a thermodynamic sense, it's thermodynamically insulated from the rest of the world. It does thermodynamic work to stay far from equilibrium uh, from, you know, with the environment. So there's a kind of a, a thermodynamic selfhood there. And, and that builds up through, through evolution in different kinds of selfhood. The self, you know, say a multicellular organism has a kind of selfhood as a multicellular collective as opposed to all the individual bits, right? All the individual bits seed some of their own selfhood, evolutionarily speaking, to the to the organism as a whole, and so on. So, um, I think that's a really interesting, a really interesting topic. Um, yeah. But I wanted to touch. I wanted to touch on the other aspect of what you just said there, which was if you're in a deterministic universe, uh -huh. then you know you can think. And and again, that's another big kind of um, starting point in the literature on free will. Interestingly, mm -hmm. in, in in, in both camps, free will deniers or skeptics or compatibilists who are the other sort of major uh, school of thought these days, where they both take determinism as true, uh, yet the free will, free will skeptics would say, well, that rules out free will. And the compatibilists will say, no, it's this kind of free will is compatible with that, um, which I find weird because determinism isn't true. And, and, you know, they, it just, at the level of physics, isn't. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, all of the stuff that we know about quantum mechanics and so on has indeterminacy in it. It's just built mm -hmm. in there from the get-go. So, um, I mean, it's, look, it's not a settled position, but that seems to be a majority position among physicists that um, this idea of the all of time being given at once in 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 the block universe i mean it was einstein's view and i'm not <laughs> it's a bit uh, arrogant to sit here and argue with him but many other people have um that you know the idea of if if everything is completely deterministic and, and it's controlled by the laws of physics right so we just have a bunch of molecules atoms quarks electrons whatever um they're subject to a bunch of forces those forces are going to play out according to the quantum fields and the, you know, the Schrodinger equation and everything. This universe is just going to evolve from one state to the next completely deterministically, which would mean that what we're saying right now was predicted at the start of time, huh. which it doesn't feel like it was because I think I'm making it up as I go along here. But, <laughs> um, but also, the, the, you know, there's a, there's a, I think probably a majority view in physics that in fact it, it isn't, right? So it's the future is not settled. Um, it's, it's uncertain. The present is what we call the moment when that indeterminacy in nature becomes resolved mm -hmm. in, in, and it, and it's not adding randomness. It, it's in as some positive force, it's indeterminacy. Things are not just not defined. The physical parameters are just not defined all in advance. They're defined through interaction and that moment of interaction that fixes those values is what we call the present. It's what we live. It's what we live in, and then things are in the past, and they're fixed, and they can't be changed. So it gives a, a direction to time. Uh -huh. um, anyway, Can we yeah, disentangle funny, the ideas of of deterministic and predictable, because I I'm wondering yeah. if if something yes. could be deterministic but not predictable. So it would appear random to us, let's say, but there's maybe just like some background cause because it it yeah. seems it seems like everything, well everything would need a cause, whether or not we, we know what that cause is. Everything can be a, everything can need a cause. That's fine. The question is, are all the causes at the lowest level? So really the challenge for uh, free will is not from determinism in this scenario. It's actually from the reductionism that's implied by determinism. So if, if all those low level interactions are deterministic, then there, there are no higher levels. The higher levels are illusory or they or they would never arise in the universe at all right higher levels of organization would never arise because uh why would they especially living things why would they arise um mm -hmm. there's no there's no option for it to be one way or the other it's just going to be the way it is um so i think the compatibilists have a a burden of proof they can't just say imagine a universe like the one we're in now that has people in it like you and me uh, and every all the other things that we seem to be agents, and then say, 
but now it's deterministic. So we could still say free will is compatible with that. I, I don't see how you even get agents like you and me in a deterministic universe. Um, but anyway, the question is, you know, deterministic versus predictable. Is it just a question about, is it describing the way nature is, or is it describing the limits of our knowledge and, and prediction? So I think it's describing the way nature is to say it's truly indeterminate. And that's what the physics, by my reading and the reading of many other mm -hmm. physicists, uh, would say. It's really indeterminate. Um, and now the problem for free will is that people would say, okay, well, that doesn't help. You know, either... Mm -hmm. <laughs> either, either, thing, either things are caused by the atoms bouncing around in my brain in a deterministic fashion, in which case are not free, or they're caused by the atoms bouncing around in my brain with some randomness, in which case they're random and I'm not making free choices. But the point is this, the randomness doesn't necessarily control the outcome, but it opens up the possibility that of these higher levels of organization having some causal power. If the next state of the system is not predetermined by the laws of physics, then something else can determine how the system evolves. And that something else can be what those, say, in a, someone with a, something with a brain, what the neural states mean to the organism. And so that, for me, can ground a causality to intentions and goals and desires and beliefs, all the things that we think we're deciding with, Mm -hmm. um, because those are themselves grounded in neural states that, that mean those things for, for us based on mm -hmm. our, based on our, our experience and the way our brains are wired. So the, the thesis, I guess, that I'm trying to develop is that the indeterminacy in nature opens the door for a non-reductive, first of all, a non-reductive structure of the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, but secondly, a, a, um, a situation where the organization of a system can do causal work, which I think is actually a co totally commonplace notion when you phrase it like that, that the organization of a system is important for how the system evolves. Yes, yeah, definitely. I don't see anything controversial about that, but you have to get away from a, a reductive way of thinking uh -huh. where you think all the, all the causality is coming from the lowest level. Right. So when I said earlier... Uh the universe is a deterministic system. I guess we can slash the word deterministic for now, but say just the universe is a single system. And then looking at any other system, it seems like that sort of requires some degree of consciousness, or it seems like what you're doing when you're looking at something. So like I'm looking around my room right now, for example, and I see a whole bunch of objects as opposed to seeing like, you know, just a single room or a single set of atoms all arranged in a different way like i'm picking yeah. up on patterns and discriminating yeah, yeah. between them but it does it's not obvious that individual objects exist outside of my mind well okay so yeah i mean that's a really interesting sort of school of, of, of thought the question of, of realism and idealism and whether um <laughs> You know, so I, I, uh, I'm a, a realist, I guess. I think these objects do exist out in the world. And I think what our visual systems have evolved to do is not just take an image based on the light that's coming into our eyes in the way that a camera does. It's to label the image, right? Seeing is not just your, your iPhone could, take, could, could see if taking an image was all that seeing entailed. It's not. The, the point of our visual system and the way it's set up is to parse that input in terms of objects in the world and what they mean for us, right? So that's how vision evolved and that's why it evolved. Um, and the great thing about vision, you know, compared to simpler senses like touch and, and, and smell is that it's long distance, right? So now we can make, it, it pays to make a map of things out in the world as you just described you doing for things mm -hmm. in your room. So, and, uh, you know, when it comes to us, it, it also pays, first of all, to, to integrate that map, to integrate it uh, with our information from other senses, to integrate it with our past experiences and our memories and these ideas of what we can do out in the world. I mean, I'm looking out at my garden. There's a football out there. I know I could kick that football. I could pick it up. There's a car. I know I could drive the car, right? Yeah. You know, so all of that is part of my, is part of my perception. It's very much action oriented. And again, from a, from an evolutionary point of view, perception and action were coupled 
intimately in in yeah. the early the earliest types of animals they, they get separated evolutionarily where you end up with sort of internal representations and so on uh, but initially they're directly coupled but it, mm -hmm. but perception is still very much action oriented um, and then the final component of it is that your experience of seeing the room is not just an experience of vision it's an experience of you experiencing mm -hmm. the room yeah right your your selfhood is part of that experience um, mm -hmm. and you can't uh, you can't divorce that from the from the visual content the, the visual content is you seeing something yeah it's not just something being seen it, mm -hmm. you're you're very much a part of that uh, that experience as well and the uh, sort of conscious perception of yourself having that experience so you get this sort of trippy buddhist buddhist like recursion right. um you know that uh people like douglas hofstadter have written about really um eloquently and evocatively um but yeah so you know perception uh, absolutely uh entails that action oriented kind of um parsing of what's out in the world and inference about um what it could be out there that is the cause of the um pattern of photons that hitting your retina at the moment mm -hmm. yeah the the example i like to use is a chair let's say it's a wooden chair and it has some metal screws in it and maybe like a leather a leather seat so i i don't know how this relates to the realism idealism thing you mentioned but like i believe the chair is really there i believe the material exists but it's not obvious that so i'll look at the screw within the chair if i look under it for example and think that's part of the chair but in reality it's it's a completely different material and it's it's just there next to it but so like you you could make a case that those two things are separate or you could make a case that they're just a giant sea of atoms and some of them are one type and right. some of them are the other yeah and it seems like and, it's my mind that decides whether to include or exclude those in the same category yeah and that's fine mm -hmm. you know i don't i don't i don't think we have to make a big <laughs> philosophical question about it it's just a pragmatic choice Right. Yeah. I mean, does it make sense for you to consider the screw as part of the chair? Well, yeah, until, you know, the screw falls out and it's on the floor or, you know, the screw is loose and you have to do something with it, in which mm -hmm. case the screw, the screw itself becomes an object of attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we parse the world at different levels. And at some, yeah. uh, at some point, I, you know, you could say, well, the chair is part of the furniture and the furniture is part of the room and the room is part of the house. It just depends what scale the house you're is thinking part of the about. universe. <laughs> so exactly. it, it so, all zooms out to this one system. Yeah. So, so for me, you know, a lot of those things, there isn't a right answer and that's mm -hmm. okay. It, it this yeah. is, again, it's, if you take a very pragmatic view and say, why would an organism have a system like this that parses things into objects, right? That's what our perceptual system is for. It's for telling right. us what's out in the world. And at some level of organization, it makes sense to treat this collection of atoms as a whole. Mm -hmm. And this, this collection of atoms over here as not a whole, because uh, when we look from a different angle, they're, they're two different things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what we want to know to survive and act in the world profitably. We want to know where are the objects out there? That's the map of things that I care about out in the world, things that could harm me or things that I could mm -hmm. eat or things right. that I could ma mate with or, uh, you know, all those things. So, um, again, I think the, you know, taking a, an ethological and an ecological approach to cognition and behavior and an evolutionary approach mm -hmm. ground it, it grounds those questions in a very pragmatic way certainly that i find satisfying because it gives a way out of these endless philosophical debates right and just say yeah. no there's no there's no right answer we're deciding to do it like this because it's adaptive to right. do that that's historically why it's like that for us to do it and that's okay right i agree with you for the most part now one um evolutionary critique of the validity of our perceptions that I've had trouble with is, is something like, you know, imagine you're in the jungle and you see a rustling in the bush and maybe it's a snake, maybe it's a tiger, maybe it's something that can kill you. So evolutionarily speaking, it would be adaptive for you to be cautious and like maybe run away from the bush, even if nothing was there. So then, so then the idea is nothing could be there, but you might imagining it's danger. Um, and so there's sort of a disconnect there between your perceptions and like your perceptions being true and your perceptions being adaptive. 
Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, one of the things, once you get to these sort of intermediate levels of representations, really they represent beliefs about what's out in the world. And the thing about beliefs is they can be wrong, right? right. You know, they can be mistaken. The question is, from an evolutionary point of view, how do you wire the system such that you uh, tune the level of false positives versus false negatives appropriately? So if right. there's something rustling in the bushes, and you're slow and you're you know you're a slow animal that can't escape very well and the bushes are pretty close to you then it's a good idea to uh, have a a very sensitive uh, alarm system right and you can tolerate lots of false positives if it means you don't get eaten right whereas <laughs> you know a, a a rabbit for example might be able to tolerate a higher level of rustling because it can move away better you know uh -huh. but again that you know that gets tweaked on a moment to moment basis so say you're an, an antelope going to the watering hole and there might be a lion in the bushes well you know if you're dying of thirst you'll tolerate a higher level of risk mm -hmm. than than otherwise and, and you know the interesting thing is that those um you know we're starting to learn a lot about the the, the circuitry that encodes uh, or or sets that level of risk um, and, you know, it's obviously set differently in different animal species, as I was just describing, but it's also set differently in different individuals within the species, including in humans. And, you know, some humans mm. are more risk averse than others. Um, and, you know, we can get it go in in mice and do optogenetics on those circuits and we can tweak, we can tweak the level of risk aversion um, by, by basically tuning those circuits ourselves. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's, uh, there's a very pragmatic view to take on that question of whether your uh, beliefs, your perceptual beliefs are veridical or not, whether they're actually true. Natural selection doesn't care if they're true. It mm -hmm. cares whether you thinking that is adaptive or not. And in some cases, it being false some of the time is going to be more adaptive than it being always accurate. Uh -huh. So this probably loops back to our earlier talk about behavioral genetics, at least in some sense, you might have a trait like neuroticism, and that might somehow be, be neurobiologically manifested in, in, in the sense of, you know, if you're overly neurotic, you have a higher likelihood of survival, but you're, you're maybe wasting energy and having a lower quality of life, but then up to a point, um, you might get eaten. Yeah. And one of the, one of the really interesting things is, um, there's loads of these parameters of that affect decision making, and you know we can in, in psychology we talk about things like conscientiousness and extroversion and neuroticism. Those are mm. really pretty high high level uh, descriptors. Uh, my own feeling is that the you know and this is based on people looking, for example, for parts of the brain that are correlated with higher or lower extroversion or neuroticism, and they don't really find them. And I think that's because mm -hmm. those aren't those aren't things in the brain. The things in the brain that underpin them are the circuits that we can find, things like risk aversion, reward sensitivity, punishment sensitivity, um, you know, delay discounting, how, how, how willing you are to wait for a reward, how quickly you discount the reward to mm -hmm. over time, confidence thresholds. Th these are all parameters we can tweak in animals as they control the decision, as they make decisions. Um, they're ones that we can see, you know, vary across people. So mm -hmm. there's a whole, you can imagine a whole sort of panel of these different things that you could tune up or down. Right. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing is there's no right answer, right? No one set of tunings is optimal for every scenario in which we find ourselves. And, and I think that that's a wonderful sort of um, uh, celebration almost of, of diversity because it, it means that, you know, the, different um, cognitive styles and different behavioral styles will be more beneficial in some scenarios versus others. And mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the really interesting aspects you know, in, in the biology of that is around what's called frequency-dependent selection, where it may, for example, be beneficial to be really aggressive, say really physically aggressive, if everybody else is really timid. Right. So then you can bully everybody else um, without fear of getting into a damaging fight that might kill you. Whereas if, if the frequency of aggression in the population increases because it's, because it's beneficial, 
And you might say you get more mating opportunities and more food because you can bully everybody, right? So then you'd expect the frequency of, of um, aggression to rise. But once it gets to a certain level, well, then it starts to be deleterious because you're, those really aggressive individuals are getting into fights uh -huh. and they're killing and they're killing you or damaging each other while the timid ones are off here. And that, sure, they're getting bullied, but they're also taking advantage of sneaky mating opportunities or things like that. And then, mm -hmm. the, then the selection swings back the other way. So, um, yeah, I th find that really interesting in thinking about the, um, the whole sort of spectrum of everything that goes into decision-making where uh, the, the, the good answer is not uh, constant and right. different sorts of aspects will be beneficial in different scenarios. Is that why many traits seem to be normally distributed? Well, I think it's it it's potentially part of the reason, uh, but more often it's just that they're so polygenic. So there's so many genetic variants that affect them only a little bit um, that it's very unlikely for any individual to affect to to inherit lots of the variants that push it one way or the other, and so you just get it you get a distribution with most people in the middle. Uh -huh. I like that last point we, we ended on um, this, this genetic diversity and diversity of experience uh, being adaptive across various environments. Yeah, I, I think it's a core, um, it, it's a core way of understanding psychological differences. First of all, that they're, as I said, they're inevitable. Mm -hmm. it, there's no, there's no way that our genome could specify just one kind of, um, pre-wired factory settings that everyone is a uh, is exactly the same that right. couldn't happen but and secondly even if it could then environmental effects would start changing us like they do with twins well that that too but also there's an adaptiveness to to that diversity of yeah. um of, of outcomes that it's not just inevitable and it's a bad thing it's inevitable and it's partly reinforced by the fact that it's broadly a good thing um you know it, but under different circumstances yeah I think that's a great place to close. Great. All right. Thank you for your time, Kevin. Yeah, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Adam. Thanks a lot. You too.